All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Okay, today I have the great pleasure of uh, speaking to someone whose history is mind-boggling. Uh, his name's Cameron Warner Jones. He is one of the co-inventors of the Synclavier Digital Music System. I don't, I don't even know what to even call it anymore because it, 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 in the end, it was much more than synthesizer. It was a system. It was an environment that people worked with. But it's the Synclavier, everyone's heard of it, uh, and I'm really excited to hear more about its history and and the process of, of putting it together. So with no further ado, let's say hello to Cameron. Hey, man, how's it going? Hey, Darren. Very nice to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule. I appreciate you uh, you doing this. Why don't we kick this off for, <laughs> I think there are going to be relatively few people who don't know of you and don't know at least some of the history of Synclavier, but I think it would be wise to just do a quick run through of like when you started working on digital systems and how you got started there. And then also what you've been, what you've done in terms of product releases from then until now, because you, you currently have products available. Certainly, Darwin. And I'll tell you, it all started the same year that I was drafted. This was 1971, when the Vietnam War was raging. I had been interested uh, in sound and music, but this was my first year of college. And I was in an environment where, uh, well, there was an electronic music studio on campus. This is at Dartmouth, right? At Dartmouth, absolutely. Dartmouth over the previous four years had to, what they did is they took this room full of computer equipment, one of the big mainframes, a Honeywell this or that, and they, they made it so you could hook up computer terminals to it. So, oh my God, you could sit uh, in a classroom down the hall and you could be typing on a Model 33 teletypewriter with, you know, paper tape loops and stuff like that. They, they became interested. The topic at the time was computer assisted uh, instruction in education. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, of course, now nowadays it's like online learning, right? Yeah, right. you watch the training videos; it's all there. But this was this was back when the interest at the time was was ways that they could incorporate computer technology uh, to help with teaching in the classroom. And obviously, I was a, a first year kid in the music department the professor John Appleton there set up a program specifically to explore computer assisted instruction in music. Uh, Dartmouth itself put up some money. The person I, who I later started New England Digital with, Sidney Alonso, created a, a little circuit board that actually let the computer make pulse waves, ramp waves and square waves. And I was the only programmer uh, on the team. So the first project we programmed, uh, it was a little, well, it was a, about, you know, bigger than a bread box computer with 4K bytes of memory. Uh, and I programmed that to, to play, this was the Benwood workbook for ear training. So uh, the computer would play the excerpts from the workbook and the, and the student would do the mel melodic dictation or, you know, that kind of stuff. And it, uh, then you know, he'd get the answers. Oh no, you, you didn't get the perfect fifth, you know? So, so that's how it started. And, and John was actually uh, interested in applying that technology to electronic music composition, which is slightly independent. Obviously that's part of the academic environment. Right. Uh, so there, there I was my first year of college and I was surrounded by, First of all, people that were interested in, in this technology. My I, I was a guitar player at the time, bass player. My jaws were dropping. My ears were perking up. Hmm. And um, I found learning to program extremely easy. I excelled at that. That's what I focused on. That's what, that's what my contribution to it was. And then... Boy, didn't it uh, didn't it escalate? And and here I am. Here I am, still doing it. You know. So we developed. It wasn't really a product. We developed that system for use within the music department at Dartmouth College. And then I did a side tour for a couple of years as part of that product. While we were using a mini computer, these were you know 
they were called mini computers and they were mm -hmm. the size of a small refrigerator and made a whole lot of noise. But Sydney and I said, you know what, we want we want to make a portable product. So we actually developed our own computer, uh, which is what you had to do in the day. You couldn't buy, you, you could buy, you could just around then you could buy the, the they were called microprocessors and the Intel 8080 and the, you know, they were little pieces of silicon. And uh, the ones that were available just were not up to the task. We needed a 16-bit computer of some kind. So we actually designed our own computer and New England Digital was founded to manufacture those it was sold to the labs uh, at the college to basically perform data collection with. The, the computer would measure the output of a, of a strip chart recorder, for example, and feed it into the time sharing system for numerical analysis. So that's actually what founded the company. Interesting. Um, and, and that's, that's uh, I think, helped us raise money the first time. We had several installations around Dartmouth of the Synclavier system. And then in... Uh, 1977. Well, I graduated from college, I believe. I'm not sure I've been back since, but uh, I was looking for work. And, and Sydney said, all right, well, either I see you later or, you know, we've been working together for six years. Do we try and commercialize this? Well, you know, I've never been one to shy away from an audition, even if I don't get the part. But we said, all right, we're going to start this company. We're going to try and sell this product. And, and we did. It was all hand to mouth. We, we started. Uh, we sold the computer. We, we were going to go viral with the computer. Uh, but that's back in the day when, like, all the computer companies were folding. Like, Orange, there was Orange Micro, and it was big, and there was PC Magazine. And you know what? Uh, the computer companies were willing to lose money hand over fist uh, to gain market share. Mm -hmm. And you had to have deep pockets to kind of play in that arena. You know, first of all, my interest was music and I like computers and I did like having a job and having a successful small business. We had maybe two employees at the time or whatever. We grew over and over again over the years. It wasn't until quite a bit later that there was significant growth. I've always been passionate about music and sound and working so many hours on compilers and technical software to help people do scientific experiments. Well, it did pay the bills, but you know what? I, I wanted to hear this thing speak. I wanted to hear it make sounds. So at that point, we developed an updated version of the FM synthesizer. And we said, well, gosh darn it, we're going to make a portable musical instrument. We, we've developed the computer. I developed the whole operating system there, the XPL computer language. So uh, that was in 1976. 1977 is when uh, we brainstormed and came up with the, the trademark name, Synclavier, which pronounced Synclavier at the time. Right. I have a stuttering problem, so it's much easier for me to say Synclavier now. So it has morphed in, in those two directions, but we made... Now, now it's referred to as the Synclavier One. It, it had one of our computers. It had the FM synthesizer. And gosh darn it, if we didn't sell 13 of those, basically to college electronic music studios, you know, there's an academic discipline called electronic music. There were from University of Washington and uh, one in Delaware and University of Massachusetts. We sold 13 of those systems. And, and then, obviously, I, I took that to the Audio Engineering Society convention. That was in 1978. That's where, for example, I met Suzanne Chiani. And who was it? Herbie Hancock uh, came and looked at the machine. And, and that was the Sinclair one. And uh, you know, it was a little bit geeky, if I can, if I <laughs> must admit. Um, but you know what? It, it made sounds that people hadn't heard before. Right. Uh, uh, when you're starting out in your career, if you run an advertising business, uh, this was back when you could make a fortune just writing jingles. That's because in order, you know, when you look at the the sitcom music of the era, well, it was all done. Uh, you had a little pit orchestra, you'd hire a trumpet, you'd hire a guitar, you had a little sax session. You'd have to write out the parts by hand. I mean, to make a 30 second jingle cost 10 grand. That's just for the personnel cost. And obviously there was a terrific interest in the advertising industry at new sounds. Because of course, when you make a, a radio or television ad, you're trying to catch people's attention and getting new sounds uh, to help you do that. Uh, so some of the younger people, the up and coming generation kind of latched onto the machine as a vehicle for, for promoting their own careers, for, for making new sounds that they could apply to their business. 
the company raised money, I believe it was in 1979. You know, we're talking uh, not exactly Wall Street sums here, but uh, it was a small uh, investment company from Boston that put in, I think it was 300 grand. So that uh, that's what put the company on on the map. And obviously, they wanted to take the computer and go national with it. Uh, and I think we we did try to do that a little bit. But uh, obviously, I was, you know, I was excited about the, the Sinclair and the sound generating part of it. And that's when Denny Yeager approached us. He was a, he ran a very successful advertising business in California, a very successful musician, synthesizer. And he said, you know what? you can revolutionize the music industry if you just come out with this stupid product. And I said, well, are you sure? In a way, I was just the programmer. Yes, I had started the company, but there was always so much technical work to do. I didn't keep track of what was going to succeed and whether the computer sales were up to snuff. And so, so we spent about six months developing, well, it was that, I, we introduced it as the Synclavier 2. And that was in in uh, May of 1980 as we went to the AES convention in Los Angeles with that. And that was uh, an instant success. And that's really what what propelled uh, things going forward. The Synclavier um, 2 is the iconic one, the large format, beautiful keyboard, right? With a rack of gear. Yeah. At the time, it was a box about the size of a small refrigerator. Uh, in, in 1980, it only did the FM synthesizer. It was a non-velocity keyboard. It was referred to as, as the original keyboard. Now it was a, a sixty note. Was that five octave? Just very light touch. An electronic keyboard. Not no velocity sensitivity. No pressure. No mod. We didn't even think of a mod wheel. Hmm. Um, this was before MIDI. Mm-hmm. A MIDI was absolutely not on the table. It was not in anyone's uh, radar. So it was a small box. You hooked up the keyboard to it. It, it was based on floppy disks. We had the the five and a quarter inch floppies, which is what Fairlight was using in the same era. And you would store the FM timbres on there. You'd boot the system from it. That's where the Synclavier 2 started. Now, that was 1980. We introduced it very quickly. Obviously, sampling was around the corner. There, were, uh, Fairlight was doing the 8-bit sampling on their CMI. They had a very neat graphical interface with a light pen and oh my god it was geeky Uh, i'm not sure it was very musical but uh you know it it, it was very functional it was great for doing rhythm rhythm enters they had this page where by typing and tapping on the screen you could put together a drum track we had a memory recorder that was more designed for recording live live performances but they are specialized in the rhythmic element of it. But obviously we could see sampling coming down the pike. There was this product, it was called the emulator. And people like Patrick Gleason had one of those. And it's less like, now they were using 12 bit sampling. So you listen to it very closely and say, wait a minute, this sounds like a the old 70 RPM. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. But Sydney and I said about 1982, and obviously, our, our our business guru Brad Naples was particularly visionary, and persistent and hardworking. And we said, "Well, you know what? High fidelity sampling is not too far away." So we began working on that. And the the pictures you see of the system from the 1980s, we developed a I, I call it a synthesizer. Uh, it was a it was called the polyphonic synthesizer. What's the difference between a recorder and a synthesizer? If you're playing back a sample, well, maybe it's just like a recorder, right. but our technology actually colored the sound in a little way because, well, we wanted variable frequency, which means we didn't do the sampling rate very accurately, but you know what? It it enhanced the sound. It made it sound live because, of course, you were you were using it to play musical notes up and down the keyboard. So that was in, in the 83 four time frame and we developed Brad particularly pushed us we developed that absolutely world class the black uh, keyboard which was incredibly expensive at the time but it we had a piano te- technician on staff it was uh, I think it was the same keyboard in fact I believe Dave Smith made that action as part of one of his products but we had a, p- a piano technician actually tune each one so it was the best playing synthesizer you could get. 
if you had good keyboard chops, you know, people like Eddie Jobson are, you know, people that really, really play well. There are still a lot of people that use that just because of that keyboard. Well, yeah, and and that's why they they keep it going. I get requests: Can you hook it up to a MIDI keyboard? Well, no, you can only hook it up to a whole computer, and you buy the whole rig. And then, of course, there were the hard disks came out. There were SCSI disk drives, and you could buy a five megabyte hard drive. And Sydney said, "Gee, Cameron, we want to do sampling. Here's the hard drive." And oh my God, my life was a nightmare for about two years. <laughs> Because the discs, you could just barely do 50 kilohertz sampling. The discs just weren't that fast. You could barely get data on and off the hard drive at the rate to support real-time audio playback. But anyway, so we branched out into the hard disk recording product. That's when we developed the tapeless studio concept, kind of from a different direction. The big the big market of the era, if, if you look at the whole history of media and whatever, this is when cable TV was skyrocketing. So instead of having just three networks, you know, all of a sudden everyone had, had cable and there were 70 channels and there was a massive demand for content. It wasn't just three primetime TV shows and the 18 ads that go along with them. Well, you had ads and music videos. So the demand for music tracks for video production just skyrocketed. And obviously, since we had the sampling, it was very natural to use our machine for sound effect placement, mm -hmm. uh, both hard sound effects, Foley effects. You know, so it's a gunshot and it's, it's in the dramatic scene. It's a scream. Yeah, but oh my goodness, you, you apply some of the synthesis techniques uh, that we did, you know, for FM synthesis and sampling, you uh, apply those techniques to quickly in real time combine sound effects. Well, you're actually designing sound effects to go in the movie or the uh, the commercial or whatever. So, so the technology that we had developed for synthesis just became in demand in in all the video post production houses. They they really needed our machine to do competitive work. So during the 80s, up until 1990, 91, 92, well, it was the first digital audio workstation. We didn't coin that term. We didn't realize what it was. Right. Uh, it, right. it started out as, you know, when we registered the trademark, Synclavier, you have to use a noun. Okay, it is this, and the brand of it is Synclavier. And we, we first called it a performance instrument. It was the Synclavier branded performance instrument, you know, key. And then it became, you know, a digital musical instrument. And then it became uh, the digital music system. And then it became the digital performance system. And somebody somewhere coined the term digital audio workstation, which then I think we did kind of adopt. But that's the history of, of NED. And Obviously, by 93, when the personal computer came out, well, th this is so hard to imagine, but it used to be you'd go in there. You go in there and there is a, you know, first of all, you need a whole room. Uh, there's the, the grand piano and all the, you know, the 24 track tape recorder, two or three of them synced together. <laughs> that is the kind of equipment that it took to make uh, all, all your recordings. And, and of course that dated from pre-CDs. That's, that's the technology that was used to create it. And the New England digital product of the era, it fit into that business model where where the studios controlled the production. They, they had big equipment budgets, they could get financing. But obviously uh, whenever the personal computer was invented, uh, you know, at, at that point, uh, it became more of a, a democratic process where it became much more practical for producers and, you know, people actually making radio commercial soundtracks and so right. forth uh, to work at home and work in a smaller environment. And and the NED products uh, just didn't fit into that business model. And NED, NED was never, a, well, how do you make the transition? Well, like 3M used to make uh, and Studer made, used to make these great big, huge tape recorders. Uh, those companies managed to segue to, to other products, but companies like Fairlight and New England Digital couldn't make the leap to what, what you, you know, you sell software and sell uh, plugins. And that was too much of a leap. So, so that came to an era end. And then I, I was kind of out of that field for a little bit. I did some work for Mackie Designs, 
Um, I did nothing for a while, which was a very good thing to do, which I had. I mean, <laughs> I started working on this shit, working around the clock, like at age 19. Right. Yeah. When you were still in school. Right. Well, yeah, absolutely. And w I remember I was turning 30 and I, I had this big light bulb moment. Oh, my God. Is that middle aged? <laughs> um, and I let I, God and this is the truth. I got out the dictionary. Middle aged. Oh, no. Middle aged is 45. So I felt a sense of relief. But anyways, I, I kind of took a leave. I, I went because I wanted to have some musical credentials before oh, whatever, before my life passed away. But uh, so I went to music school for two years. I studied double bass and I had an orchestra job, which was really important to me. So I did that and I worked for Mackey for a while. But then there was a successor company to NED and they didn't do very well. And then somebody bought it up over here. Then the bank foreclosed. And I think it was in 1998, I actually approached the bank that foreclosed. All right, here, I'll, I'll just take it off your hands. So a person who had worked at NED, Brian George, bought up the hardware pieces. I bought up the software pieces. So in 2000, that's when I did the first product that used uh, a modern Mac computer to, to perform the computational function. So you could hook up the original voice cards and mm -hmm. the original tower, and you hook it up to a, a modern Mac. So you use a Mac and your network to store your sound files. And, and that was called Synclavier Power PC. And that was when the Power PC computers just before the Apple G3 and all that era, which was right around 19, right around 2000. And so Brian and I did that product. We had a hundred installations of that. That carried us through to about 2004. And then uh, between 2004 and 2014, there really wasn't any development. There was no technical breakthrough that let me do anything else with that existing technology. I was busy pursuing my career as an actor and as an actor in musical theater. I'm talking if I sing in this one professional musical theater company in the province, okay, I finally got a gig with them. I'm not talking Los Angeles or New York or Carnegie Hall, but you know what? It meant so much to me. There was no real technological development that let me do anything else. But by about 2014, 2015, about the time all the computers became 64-bit operating system, their ability to crunch numbers was just, well, it was a whole new level. At that point, the computer could actually recreate the audio, not just control the digital voice cards, but actually model the digital voice cards and create the audio, very sounding like the original machine. I had sent out feelers with, with, with a couple of the big plug-in companies, and I had some a uh, couple talks with people. But our, right away in, in, in 2014, Arturia, I guess, was they were really uh, getting successful with their V-Collection product. So they, they really approached me and said, all right, well, it, it's time to do this. And, and so that's when I really went back to work on the product full-time, and I, I created the DSP engine that I have which really models the original hardware and the sound of the original system with all its defects, the 8-bit FM grunge. And you know what? It's, it's neat sounds. And the intonation errors are all modeled in there. And you know what? It's got a sound that you, you don't hear in, in a sterile recording sampling environment. It, the sounds have a character to them. And if you, if you don't want that character, well, you can buy a hard disk recorder and it'll <laughs> play back. But okay, it sounds like Synclavier. Well, you know, it does. So that product uh, was successful and continues to be successful. And then it was, uh, you couldn't buy the parts for the Synclavier Power PC anymore. The quick logic, little goofy thing, you know, wasn't made anymore. Uh, but I kept getting calls, gee, can you make more? Can you make more? Can, can you make more? So in 2016, I partnered with um, another person who worked at New England Digital, Mitch Marcoulier, and we developed kind of our third generation of, it's a digital product that it's a little interface box, a little tiny thing uh, about the size of a cigarette box. In fact, I did that hardware 
design. I bought a CAD program and I, okay, I laid out the circuit board and gosh darn it, if it didn't work. And so we built, uh, well, like I say, we're up to unit 65 of that now. But so people are around the world, they've gathered pieces of the Synclavier systems that were built over time. That particular product hooks it up to a Thunderbolt chassis on a current Mac. So for managing your sound files and your timbres and it, you know, it hooks up through, uh, you're using a modern computer and a big screen. Uh, right. So it's very useful in that regard, but it still uses the old, uh, it controls the old hardware. And we're building more of those. We're eyeing uh, maybe another new product that we might come out with. I don't know if it'll make as big a splash as the original. That is the, the technology and the events um, that's occurred in my lifetime. That's an amazing career. And it's, it's amazing to see, see you go through things that now kind of in retrospect, they almost seems like, well, there's the logical path, right? But I'm sure it seemed like anything but logical at the time. It seemed, it had to seem like every single step was a complete dice shake. Well, um, it, it, it was particularly good. Brad Naples was a very visionary person and he saw the market needs for the product i was like clueless i was mm -hmm. you know i knew how to get the technology to work we got the sound on and off that five megabyte hard drive and, and that was his own challenge but to me it was i i never during, at the time i just never paid attention to to what the historical importance of it or, or right. the big market uh sure. I'm glad I was working on a team that had someone on the team with that kind of vision right? Be, because they were able to, to create a successful business uh, and I was doing the technical part of it. But, uh, but here we are. It's just, it's just, that's, that's the story. It's amazing. Now I have like 900 questions related to that stuff, but before we do that, one of the things I want to do is I do want to talk a little bit about your personal background, kind of like before Dartmouth really, and before sure. you got involved in this, because to do what you did, you mentioned that you were a musician, a guitar player, but obviously you had some real technical chops too. I'm curious, what was... What were the things, what was the, were the musical influences that made you gravitate towards music? And what were the technological things that, that drove you into being a programmer developer? And how did, I mean, you kind of talk about how they merged. It merged maybe by happenstance, but I'm wondering to what extent you were influenced or drawn into it as well. Sure, Darwin. It's it's a very specific story, and it's all very real to me. I, I remember things from 1960 much better than I remember things from yesterday. <laughs> it started out when I was 10 years old, maybe eight, eight years old, 1960. I was going to summer camp, and the older counselors would play their guitar. You know what? And my ears would cringe because the guys didn't know how to tune their guitars. And I've always been extremely sensitive to intonation. In fact, when I've got my first guitar, you know, you play a perfect fifth, you bend the string a little bit, you hear the, the strings, the pitches go in and out of phase. You know, my eyes were just, and my, it's like, my God, I love this sound. <laughs> so my career started, I asked the counselor if they would let me tune their guitars, which they did. And I got very good at that. And, you know, even the B string, they'd play a C chord and people wouldn't cringe. <laughs> so I, I was interested in sound in that way too, but also going on the huge situation from 1960 to 1965 was uh, the U.S. space program. And there was so much interest in technology. So also at summer camp, this was a later edition of summer camp, I bought a book. It was called like a basic electricity and it talked about vacuum tubes. And a neighbor down the street had a shortwave radio. And I heard, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. you know, my ears, I went ballistic. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, the Morse code, da 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 you know, whatever it is. I found all that to be extremely musical. I mean, it, it sounds, it's pitches. So I became interested in shortwave radio. I built a Heathkit you know, for $25, it was a shortwave radio. And of course, 
you could listen to Radio Moscow. And when you, there's the Cold War going on and the Sputnik and you hear Radio Moscow, it, I mean, it's very, very interesting for a youngster coming of age that period of time. So there was a lot of interest in, in technology. And so that's why I learned about it. And actually, this I was in public high school in 1968. This was, well, it was called a programmable calculator. It was this little box that Wang made. What it was, it was, again, uh, it, it, obviously it was a computer. It was a calculator. It was a little box about the size, well, about the size of this little thing I'm looking at here. But uh, it, it had a, a, a numeric display and a little box that went on the floor. And it was programmed, uh, well, they call it punch cards. Remember the IBM punch sure. cards and the data cards? Well, you, you buy the data cards, which is like 80 columns and 12 bits wide or something like that. You buy the cards and they were perforated. So you could punch out the little holes in it. And that's how, anyway, so I wrote my first piece of software. This was for a high school chemistry cat class. By poking holes in the punch card, oh, I made a mistake. I used a little piece of electrical tape to cover up the hole and punched out the right <laughs> hole. It's like now you hit the delete key, right? Right, right. So uh, I took the punch card and it goes in the card reader. And in chemistry, I think it was the Nernst equation. You know, it's not E equals I pi or you know E equals MC squared. It was some something to do with chemistry and how many moles of this and kilograms, you know, whatever. So I programmed it and. I felt very powerful. I felt I felt like I'd had a hit record. I can okay, I can write software and people will notice this, and it will do things. I mean, at that time, uh, this was when folk music was the era. I started out in guitar, but uh, there were a lot of guitars, so I migrated to bass. Also, it's only four strings, so maybe and, and you don't have to worry about the stupid <laughs> uh, the B string being tuned to fourth instead of a fifth. And then when I got to college, I, we had a, it was a bluegrass band, and we were in great demand. And I, I love to perform. I love sound. Um, I, I love music. And, and actually, my, my interest, and in, of course, what, I, what I've done later, what I'm personally motivated by is the storytelling aspects of music. That's why I like musical theater. Uh, I think it's a great form. It's an oral tradition. Every musical theater piece has great education. It's just a way for young people to, to vicariously experience, like West Side Story, what happens when things go wrong, you know? So I was always always interested in music. Uh, just just my ears perk up whenever I hear something like that, and and the technology. So it all, I was in the right place at the right time. I mean, I was there, and, and things were happening. And I said, you know what? Uh, I like this. I feel at home in this. So that's how I got I got into the field. It, it was very, very emotional, very very passionate involvement on on my part. Now I I know that John Appleton was was really in one of the guiding lights there at, at Dartmouth. To what extent did he draw you in, or did you go and like put him up against the wall and say I have to work on this? Or how did that how did that interaction occur? I'll t I'll tell you exactly. And this was as I mentioned earlier, there was uh, a program, there was a, a movement. What would you call it um, within Dartmouth? to explore the use of the computer in education. Uh, so there was a professor at the engineering school, uh, Fred Hooven. Uh, John, he graduated from Columbia, oh, must have been about 66 or 68. I'm embarrassed, I don't remember. This is when colleges were establishing electronic music studios. That was, they have a classics department, they have a this, they have a voice department. Well, okay. Uh, around the country, colleges were setting up electronic music departments. So Dartmouth was doing that. John Appleton was the professor in charge of the Bregman Electronic Studio there. I never met Mr. Bregman, but I believe he was the, one of the big uh, donors that helped get, get that uh, going. The year before I started there, uh, John Appleton from the music department and Fred Hooven from the engineering school said, well, all right, let's let's combine this computer technology and music and make a little sound box. So they had the program going. John Appleton and Fred Hooven convinced Dartmouth, all right, we're going to assign some internal resources to, to try and make a little thing that the students can use. So basically they posted a job opening. They needed someone to do the programming. 
during my first year at college, uh, I was taking a lot of mu music courses. I had a counterpoint course uh, that actually was taught by John, uh, unrelated to his electronic music. Right. Uh, uh, there was a, a counterpoint class, you know, just traditional music theory. And obviously I heard about that. And basically, there were, you know, they needed a student programmer. This is when computers got their summer job working in the computer lab. Well, you know, I beefed up my resume. Hey, I, I had written, uh, you know, I, I had on that stupid Model 33 typewriter. It's not that I could get it to sing and dance, but you know what? You make the head go back and forth. It draws graphics on the yeah. on the on the paper. The bell, <laughs> God, this is funny. Like it's got this bell, and you you could make it do rhythms, right? So I programmed the Model Thirty Three teletypewriter as if it was a musical instrument, and so people noticed that. So in the summer of nineteen seventy two. That's when I was hired as a student programmer. So it, it was really John Appleton. And, and Fred Hooven, who had the initiative to kind of push within Dartmouth the use of electronics and computers in the field of music. They tapped into Sydney at the engineering school and assigned Sydney the task of, of making a little uh, device so the computer could make the tones. And they hired me as the programmer. And gosh darn it, if we didn't get it to work, I didn't realize it was revolutionary or whatever it they were crude sounds but you know what it was the first time that a person could compose music by typing right. you, uh, you now nowadays of course you use Sibelius or you use a composing tool uh, you you enter the notes on a page using your software and you create a MIDI file and you hear it but but this was the first time you could uh, you could go to a computer you could use a, a language we developed two or three computer languages at the time so you could actually create a soundtrack by sitting at a computer, editing, editing the text file, hitting the play button, and it would render that description of the music into audio. I'm, I'm a little curious. In that time frame, were you aware or did you interact at all with like the things that Max Matthews was doing or some of the things that they were doing? Yes, exactly. Out of Columbia? How, how did those, how did people, I mean... You know, now you'd be like on a on a some sort of forum on the internet, like exchanging ideas. A clearly, a different uh, a different time and different technologies. What was the way that you interacted with all the other people that were inventing musical computers, or especially, I think of inventing musical computer programming languages. You know that that was a real rich environment, but I, you had to be talking to each other in in seventy one. Uh, well, yes, in fact. I did several trips uh, to Bell Labs and met Mac, Max Matthews. So I would say uh, that was all on John's initiative. Obviously, John graduated. Uh, he did his graduate work at Columbia. Uh, and this is where, you know, the people of the era like John Chowning, they were a clique. They were a club. And, and they were, I, and I don't mean that in a negative way, they were the leading group of, of of intellectuals that were were just creating this technology and and defining this academic endeavor called electronic music. So there was a lot of networking amongst those individuals. Uh, there was a trade show. Uh, boy, this goes back. There was a Brit company. I think it was called EMS, and this was right around 1971. It was a big tabletop thing, and you plug pins in the board to do the patch. You know, like a Moog synthesizer, the yeah, the, the original Moog. E the EMS it's, Synthi is what you're talking about. Yeah, there we go. With the Moog stuff, it all mounts on a rack, and it was quarter-inch phone jacks, and you plug it together that way. There was a trade show, if you'd call it that. There was a convention also that summer of 71 at Dartmouth, and I didn't participate in it. I just saw it. But EMS, there were a bunch of synthesizers being exhibited there. So there was a lot of networking uh, within the academic community sure. about where that technology was and how it was going. There were also some publications. Do you remember the Computer Music Journal? I do. People were writing about this. this the term digital audio didn't, didn't come up. It was all computer. The term was computer music. Like, oh, my God, we're going to do computer music. So there was a lot of networking there. 
uh, there were those publications. There were conventions starting to spring up. Uh, I went to two in Chicago. Maybe they were affiliated with the Computer Music Journal. So th- there was networking there. But obviously, there was no internet. You had to go to the library. Uh, and, and mostly you d- you visited with, with other people working in the field. And if it's academia, they aren't quite so protective of their trade secrets. And uh, I learned how to program. I had to develop my own computer language several times, actually. One of the things that propelled uh, NED very successfully, back in that day, like when Apple was doing, remember, what was it, the Apple II? They were all programmed in assembly language. Mm -hmm. It was extremely difficult, but there was a movement at Dartmouth to develop, uh, you know, higher level languages. There's a language called PL1, and there's a derivative of that called XPL. It's very much a modern computer language. Obviously, C and C plus are the standard, uh, you know, workhorse computer languages. Obviously, there's more languages at a higher level, but uh, there was a movement to get those modern language, computer languages up and running for the programmers at Dartmouth. Uh, so I wrote an XPL compiler that let us use XPL to write software for our own computer. And that allowed us to be vastly more productive than, than anyone else. That's one of the reasons yeah. we were able to succeed. Uh, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, since you're building your own computers, you had to... Not only were you having to come up with your own languages and your own compilers, but you had to come up with your own equivalents of operating systems. You know, probably prior to the sampling, I guess you could have, you know, you know, it was it was basically just a, a runtime management system. But by the time you had to get to disk management and stuff, you had to have some sort of operating system, right? Yeah, I, I wrote the bastard from scratch. <laughs> that's that's why I stutter. Yeah. Okay. Was... That's why. I, that's why I'm hardly hearing in one ear. No, I did. I absolutely. Actually, one of the Dartmouth systems was based on a Data General mini computer. Mm-hmm. They had a, it was called the Nova. Yeah. And it was a 16-bit mini computer. It you could buy 16 kilobytes of memory for it. These were core memory, the iron core memories mm-hmm. on a circuit board, 15 inches square. They had a primitive DOS. It was called DOS which stands for Disk Operating System. And obviously there was MS-DOS coming along at that era. And I use it and say, you know what? I, I can't stand to use it. This is just like so primitive. You know, it's just like, I, I wanted something that was fun to use, right? Like, so on the data general computer, I started with their operating system. But again, I wrote the XPL language to create the object code for the data general computer. And... There were enough sources, like you could buy the tape drivers and the disk drivers from them, or they, you know, uh, there was enough open source material. But I had to do the scheduler, I had to do the interrupt handlers, I had to do, I had to do the text editor, and it kept me busy when, when I wasn't <laughs> playing in, in, in the Bitterroot Mountain Boys. I was, uh, I was programming. That's that's for sure. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine now with the plethora of tools that we have to to have to to grind out at that level. Now, in terms of like the the thing that the core Synclover was written in, was that always based off of this XPL language? Oh yeah, the whole thing, uh, absolutely, lock, stock, and barrel. I, I I had developed that one of the one of this kind of side shoots that we did at Dartmouth. Uh, this was in the, the 74 time frame. Sydney and I had developed this little two card processor. Uh, I had developed software that lets the local computer take the measurements from the scientific experiment. Like you're doing any kind of experiment where you, let's say you're trying to measure the rate of a chemical reaction or sure. something silly yeah, like that. Right. Uh, so you, you mix the oil and the vinegar or the, you know, whatever. And, and how long does it take to solidify? Well, you end up with data from a strip chart recorder. You want to get that into the computer system so you could do uh, numerical analysis on it. So Arla computer had a little A to D converter on it. You could measure the signal. I wrote the software that would collect that data and transfer into the time sharing system. You know, we had 50 installations at Dartmouth by the time or more or whatever. And this is when everything was becoming computerized. So part of that project for a whole summer, I spent developing the XPL compiler, which there was a version running on the Dartmouth 
time-sharing computer. So I could actually program in the Dartmouth version of XBL and have it create the language, mm -hmm. interpret its own language and create the object code for the data general. And, and then, of course, for our own machine. And so XPL was uh, the only software language we used. Towards the very end, this is when the Mac 2FX came out. There was the Apple Lisa computer. Pascal was becoming a language. And actually, Pascal and XPL are, are very, very similar in terms of capability. And Pascal, I think that wasn't, wasn't that UCSD, wasn't that? Yep. So Pascal was a language. And I think that's one of the things that really helped Apple succeed. The Microsoft people were still stuck in assembly language. Apple was doing its work in Pascal and object Pascal. And then the C programming language kind of transitioned in there. So we started using a Mac as a front end for Synclavier, you know, during 85, 86, you would use a Mac as, as a graphical front end. For, we had a music printing package that would run on the Mac. And of course, the sounds would all come out of the machine. So there was that computer language there. But within the Synclavier, uh, everything, even today, is lock, stock, and barrel. It's all in the XPL computer language, which translates to C extremely well. In other words, it's an if-then-else computer language. Right, right. But it's like even the the Arturia implementation or your iOS implementation, they have a XPL back. The the core of it is still written in XPL. I wrote an XPL to C translator. Oh, fabulous! Amazing. Okay, in, again, in my spare time, right? Sure. I, okay, gee. <laughs> in between acting, right? There you no, go. so I'd, I'd done all my arpeggios. I'd finished my practicing. I'd done my vocal warm-ups. All right, I'm going to write an XPL to C translator. <laughs> well, it was either that or abandon my life's work. I mean, it, sure. it's, not, it's not that I'm stuck in, in the mud, but you know what? That was my life for 20 years. We're talking from age 20 to age 40. I mean, that's that's a significant portion of a person's life. I didn't want to let go of that. I said, you know, I know this is obsolete technology, but you know, the, the way it works anyway. So, so I translated some of that software into C mostly I, for the Arturia product, of course, it's all written in, in C plus internally. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a huge graphical user interface which hosts the whole product. I'm, I'm only, right. my contribution is the DSP engine of it. it. Um, so I developed a representation of the Synclavier hardware model to a little bit of an alarming level of detail with all the shortcomings that we had in the hardware. So it created the original sounds, which I had off of floppy. So I was able to convert the timbres so they would work in the Arturia product. It was it was all very, very authentic. So going all the way back to the Synclavier, Sinclair one two, I mean most of the voice. What was the division of labor between what the voice cards did and what the software did? Well, I'll tell you exactly. Back in that era, the computers were not capable of processing the audio in any way, shape, or form. I mean, it just okay. took uh, the computer we had. You know, had roughly a one microsecond cycle time. Like it, it could take a sixteen bit. Oh, no floating point hardware floating mm -hmm. point took you know, ages it, it was a real challenge for the computer to get one channel of digital audio on and off the hard drive there was no number crunching real-time number crunching so you needed dedicated hardware to actually create the samples and feed them into the digital to analog converter so you could hook up a speaker and and hear the puppy uh, they were called voice cards that's a generic term. It's a piece of computer hardware that connects to the computer. And we had a little parallel, a 16 bit data bus that you could connect devices to. So the voice card connects to the computer that way. And the computer, the computer's like the manager. The computer says, All right, we want this kind of pulse wave. And there was a little ratio metric oscillator. So it didn't have a lot of pitch resolution. It would make the Western scale. You could do harmonics. You could do intervals. So the software would, would in effect, turn on the voice card and tell the voice card to go. And the voice card would ha it'd have an accumulator and a counter. So it would start taking the samples out of memory and feed them out to the D to A. You needed that hardware technology to actually produce the audio. Uh, nowadays, your iPhone, your 
most bottom of the barrel compute module you get, you know, in nanoseconds, you know, it's just like, it takes data in memory. And of course there's USB interface to get it to the outside world. Uh, but the computer, the computer is creating and crunching the audio. That's exactly what the hardware of the era could not do. Got it. Well, and I think, I think too, one of the things that maybe is a little, uh, is a little uh, misleading is we is we talk about it as a voice card, which makes you think like, oh, it's an implementation of an oscillator. But no, especially since they were these were FM voices, it had to have multiple oscillators. It had to implement all of the envelopes because again, the envelopes weren't going to come from the software. It had to implement all the amplitude modulation necessary for for gain control. And so all of this kind of stuff that you talk about having this data bus, it seems like with computers at the time, even data bus clogging would have been, could have been kind of a problem. That's one of the things that helped NED 16. In fact, we got a patent on this partial timbre method. And that is exactly what the voice cards were. There was a digital oscillator to create the pitch. You needed two one for the modulator, one for the carrier, if you're going to do FM. But then, yes, you need an envelope generator, you know, to give it an attack and a decay and any kind of musically useful kind of sound. So the oscillator, the, the voice card, had those different components to it. We were issued two patents early on. And the envelope generator, it had three sections to it. One, one was a volume control. Now, you used a D to A, an 8-bit D to A in the FM case to create a reference voltage that fed into the second DDA to control the volume output of the second DDA. And the second DDA was, that's where the envelope, again, it was an eight bit envelope. So boy, you could hear the clicks and pops. So there was an envelope generator that would ramp the envelope up and down, like for a sharp attack, you need a one millisecond ramp time. And then it created a reference voltage outfit, output that was fed into the wave DAC. So you have separate hardware. So there's really four components. There's the oscillator, which tells you when to move the audio data around. You have the memory that has the samples in it. You have a wave DAC that takes the sample, presents it to the, you know, to the speaker. And then you have the envelope generator feeding the reference voltage on the wave DAC. And so the result is a musical instrument. I mean, this mm -hmm. is where... The, the voice card just just gets the audio data out, but you're absolutely right. You have to you have to gate it intelligently. You have to modulate it in a way that's musically useful that makes interesting sounds that, for example, you can sell you know to make sure. radio commercials out of. Right, right. Now, one of the things that that uh, the Sinclair was like way pre MIDI, and and this whole concept of a of a tapeless studio was pretty novel prior to, to MIDI, but MIDI comes traipsing along. Did the, did NED ever have any kind of a MIDI interface for the Synclavier system? Yeah, it did. When MIDI came out, I remember one of our customers did that. It was called the Lynn drum machine. Remember yeah. Roger Lynn? Sure. Yeah. And he did, I think he might've done 50 kilohertz sampling. His, his unit sounded pretty good. Someone brought up uh, one of his drum machines and connected it over MIDI, and it, re it really caught the attention of the of the brass at NED. Um, I, in fact, uh, maybe it occurred to them: Wait a minute, this is this is where the industry is going. You don't have to buy a big, expensive piece of equipment from just one manufacturer. You can get different pieces from different manufacturers and hook them together. So yes, right around then, that would have been actually fairly, when, what year was that? That must have been 83, 84. Technically, MIDI was extremely easy to implement. It's basically just an 8-bit serial port. Right. And so we, we did hook up a MIDI interface. It was all, always kind of problematical. I mean, the, the modern MIDI sequencer, while you set your tempo, you talk about your quarter notes, it divides the you know, beats per measure. And uh, our sequencer was a real-time sequencer, but, but we did, we did take MIDI in and out to, to generate notes. Oh, and then there were mod wheels and foot pedals. And yes, we also had a guitar interface. Oh, that's right. Which that wasn't over MIDI. That was a Roland guitar that it had a pickup where every string had its own pickup. Right. 
And so the strings were fed into uh, a pitch detection mechanism. And I remember Pat Metheny and others, it was just, uh, see, I was a guitar player, so. So that resonated with you. Well, huh? <laughs> I could get it to work because, oh my God, the transients on a guitar. Like when you play a MIDI keyboard, you press the key. Okay, what's the velocity? But there it is. Right. Uh, with a guitar, it's a much more elusive, much more yeah. um, vibrant input. Yeah, and, right. and you have to you have to spec you have to guess a little bit on and but you want the note to come out right away, okay? But maybe not right. Oh, but it'll be right within a couple of milliseconds. And you know what? It sounds like a guitar twang. So that was actually pre MIDI. Our ro- our uh, guitar interface was was pre MIDI. But yeah, so um, well, I'm curious though now because I remember when when Pat Metheny first started using that, I was kind of blown away that he would that he would use it first of all. But I, I'm curious, it, it seems like for someone at that at that level, he probably like came and knocked on your door and said, hey, let's get this right. I mean, had, was did you have a lot of interaction from a developer standpoint? Did you have a lot of interaction with artists who were motivated to have NED get it right? Oh yeah, I think, I think that was a, a very important part of our synergy. I remember working with people, well, like Frank Zappa was extremely interested. He had a big synclave. In fact, he had the biggest system uh, towards the end of his life. But he had, he had a studio tech who came to NED for, for several months. And I would work with him, you know, okay, what kind of computer language, what kind of changes can, can we make in how the system works? So it would be it could be more useful in his situation. So uh, obviously we were on the bleeding edge. People were always saying, well, gee, we want this. We want this. Can it do this? Uh, We need more storage. It has to be faster. We need more voices. We need more music printing. Uh, So, so there were a lot of requests we were getting from the customer for, for capabilities in that way. But obviously, you know, behind every great artist or behind is the wrong word, uh, Every great artist, when that artist has a successful work, I mean, there's a creative team producing the puppy. And like Barbara Streisand uh, did did the album, but it was Alby Gluten that well, did the synth track and did the, you know, design the sounds. And he said, wait a minute, this FM, we need this and we need that. And people like, uh, well, like Michael Jackson, for example, well, you know, Quincy Jones was doing a lot of work getting the sounds, getting the performers. So there was a lot of collaboration. And on the other front, like from a pedagogical point of view, Oscar Peterson was a big customer. His use of the system was very pedagogical. He would he would play in a track and then improvise right on top of his own. And he was using that to teach jazz improvisation. So he needed extra things in the sequencer to have it be easier and faster to use. So there was a lot of collaboration uh, over the years. This went on for a very long time. I, you know, you know, nowadays it's like, oh, the internet comes and goes, or like, oh, there's Facebook. Oh, Facebook's gone. Now it's this. You know, it's just like things change very quickly. But this went on really. It, it grew, but the fundamental technology was, uh, shall we say, 22, 23 years from 1971 to 1993. Right. And that core technology did not change during that period of time. It grew, but it was all based on the 16-bit sampling out of the poly memory and, and the same operating system as primitive as it was. So it took, there was a lot of collaboration on evolving that body of work over that 20, 22 year period. And to a certain extent, maybe that's why it's still here, you know? Yeah. Well, I want to talk about what we still have, because in a way it kind of, and excuse me for saying this, it, I mean, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around the implementation as it is now. And we'll, let's talk about the Arturia V version, sure. right? Um, first of all, in, in the Synclavier system, the hardware did so much of the work. Now you have to translate all that hardware into a software implementation, how could you how could you get the the conceptual how could you get the artistic taste of that hardware translated into software in any kind of direct way 
Well, uh, first of all, I, I was completely familiar with the hardware design. Mm-hmm. Uh, at college, yeah, you would have my, had to be right. I was a software specialist, but uh, in fact, when I went to college, that was really before computer science was an academic discipline. It was just starting to become an academic discipline. Although my undergraduate thesis, my graduate thesis was was the XBL compiler, that was at the engineering school, and I took courses in computer hardware. and And the struggle that Sydney and I did—I mean, he and I. Uh, just put in a lot of long hours. It, it was okay. There's the hardware. You could you could buy this data book, right? You could. There's the chip. There's the specs for the DDA converter. There's the chips for the S184 accumulator register memory chip. Okay. How do you turn this into a musical instrument? Well, Sydney said, "Well, we can put the chips together this way and this way." And I said, "Wait a minute. That's going to be screwed. It's not going to do this. Can you do this? Can you do that?" So he and I spent years and multiple iterations, just trying to massage what was available in, in the computer hardware world, what we could do in software, and, and what would be a good, a good musical product for the end user. In terms of translating it into a modern computer language like C, C can model that kind of computer hardware extremely easily. The challenge in the Arturia product is that all, everything modern is based on a fixed sampling rate. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. You mentioned that you had a variable sample rate. And I'm like, how does that translate into something that has a fixed fixed sample rate output? The, the secret, Darwin, and this is where I, I'm not, you know, there are some people who are PhDs at this and they talk about Laplace transforms and the Z domain. And I understand that if I can hear it, I understand about frequency response and, and, and I'm pretty good with numbers, but the oscillators in this Sinclair, of which, and I'm referring to the FM oscillator and the polysynth oscillator. Basically the polysynth oscillator was a 12 bit version of the FM oscillator, which was an eight bit version. When you use that oscillator to create a periodic signal or to do sampling, well, there's minute errors in the sampling. Right. That era of technology, you actually, it wasn't fixed rate. You know, you just, to make a different pitch, you, you record in a musical note, a C. Oh, you want to play CDE uh, on the scale. Well, you, you play the sample back faster and, yeah, and it goes up in goes pitch. It's a sample rate, right? Yeah. Nowadays, uh, a modern sampler, it's a fixed rate system. So they use a software sample rate conversion algorithm to actually allow that one sample to play back faster at a higher pitch, you do it by decimating the samples and there are algorithms to do that. And people spend multiple coffee cups debating, okay, this sample rate algorithm is better than that. And, oh, I like the sound of this one. This one is better at transients. We didn't have that luxury. We had the computer, We or the oscillator was actually a, every voice card when it was operating at its own sampling rate. Uh, so one of the things I developed as part of the Arturia product is a mathematical model that figures out what the spectral impacts of those variable sampling rates are. Like if you analyze it, if you run a variable rate sampling system through a spectrum eye analyzer or through an audio analysis tool, well, you can see what it does and it blurs the spectrum a little bit. I'm coining a new name for it because, uh, you know, we might use this in a product someday. I call it time domain dithering. And what it is, dithering, uh, people are familiar with dithering. When you have a 16-bit converter, well, the quantization error starts to become audible. If you add a little bit of random noise in it down at the one-bit level, well, you dither the samples plus and minus one. And oh, okay, instead of sounding distorted, well, there's a little bit of a white noise noise floor, but it doesn't bother you. Synclavier, the hardware design that we had did that at the hardware level in the time domain. And it was the samples would be a little bit early and late. It's very similar to dithering the audio level, the way a D-Day can, I can see your eyes glazing over. <laughs> no, no. I'm thinking, I'm imagining the an implementation of this. So no, this again, this is, this is mother's milk to me. So just let her run. <laughs> so the Synclavier, because it was a very, well, it was a hybrid system. I mean, it was a digital oscillator. The samples were in memory, but the envelope generator uh, I described, uh, it was all analog. It was VREFs from one D to A to the other. Then we had an analog oh, distributor. Interesting. That would, you'd take the 
16 voices and route them to 16 analog mm-hmm. outputs. So there, there was an analog component to its sound and, and starting with the time domain dithering. So what, what I've done is I've developed a mathematical model that allows us a fixed rate system to recreate the audio artifacts. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why the sampling and some of the stuff I'm working on sounds, it sounds different than what you hear when you're just using traditional sample rate conversion algorithms. It, it captures the, the sound of the variable rate system, the hybrid analog digital systems. And uh, that, that's what we're trying to do. That's the mission we're on now. That's, that's fantastic. That's really exciting. I love to hear about it. Now, this also, hearing about this and makes me want to ask sort of a flipped question. And this is something that I like asking people. Generally, I do it offline, but I'm going to hold, I'm going to put, put you out in the spotlight on this one. You have had quite a career with one, with primarily with one thing with many implementations. Is there anything that you wish you would have done differently that might have made the whole thing easier or the whole thing better? Or, or do you feel like, like you lucked into the right path all along the way? In hindsight, I wished I had done my more advanced music education earlier in my career because I really felt hampered by that really? um, uh, up until I went to IU at, uh, in 1982. I think one of the challenges of any art technology kind of product is if you're sitting in the middle as the inventor, there are genius creative types that want to use this instrument to make sounds with, and they want to use it in ways that you know op- makes your jaw drop. You're going to do what? You combine these sounds, and oh, you're going to do what? And, and next thing you know, we have a, a rocket ship taking off made from a a cat growl or something. You know, it's just like. <laughs> right. Particularly once I had two years of, of real professional music education under my belt, at least I had some common terminology with music and sound designers and you know things like intonation and you know articulation and rhythmic accuracy. And I had the right vocabulary. You know, for the first 10 years, I was well, I was always trying to decipher what they were meant. And they were saying, listen, you idiot, can't you do this? <laughs> can't you make the machine do this? You know, why does it have to sound this way? You know, seeing the technology develop in, in front of you. And I used to read the Audio Engineering Society papers. You know, one of the big discussions was, again, in 1980 and 1981. This is when the compact disc was just being created. Well, we were pushing for 50 kilohertz sampling Mm -hmm. because we really felt that that made it technically feasible to really do full fidelity sampling. Oh, but no, they had to fit it on a CD or, well, whatever, before the CD, they they could only fit so much data on, on a platter that would fit in the car radio. So they ended up doing 44-1 sampling. But I've always had good, good collaboration w- with the creative types. But uh, th- that's the one thing. I- I'm glad I did it at age 30 when I was turning middle-aged. Oh, my God, I was sweating bullets. Uh, I found that really, really helpful. And, and I'm able to use that, uh, like in talking to the Arturia team, has a great team of sound designers working on their product. Right. Uh, I guess that's one thing I'm jealous. Oh my God, I wish I could have a sound design staff like that. So I, I'm able to talk to them in their language now. And I, I think that's been very helpful. It's really amazing. Well, Cameron, I want to thank you for having spent this time for, uh, for humoring me and wanting to dive into all of these different, uh, these different avenues and these different inlets of your, uh, of your mind. It's fascinating. And again, I feel like I could, I could do for another several hours of this, but, uh, we are going to wrap it up. I want to be sensitive about your time. I want to thank you so much for doing this and, and I really appreciate it. Well, Darren, I'm glad I could be here. I look forward to uh, talking again sometime. We'll see you later. All right. Many thanks to Cameron for having the great chat. Uh, and for helping us learn a little bit more about both the history and the current status of uh, this Enclavier system. 
Uh, it's really, uh, really amazing to think of all of the things that we now take for granted, all having to be invented on the fly by a guy like Cam. So uh, thanks so much to him. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, whatever, give me a uh, ring. I'm darwin.gross at gmail.com, ddg at cycling74.com, or ddg at 20objects.com. Any of those will work. Feel free to drop me a line, and uh, other than that, I will catch you next time around. Bye.